Good morning. Who here is excited to be here today? All right, good to hear. My name is Travis Allen. I am a junior at Kennesaw State University, about to be a senior, studying business management, and I'm also the president and founder of iSchool Initiative. And today, I want to share with you my journey of becoming a mobile learner and what that means. Now, I want to focus on three points this, uh, this morning. First, I want to talk about the birth of iSchool Initiative, what it is and how it was created. Second, I want to talk about a very important question I think we should ask, why mobile learning? And third, I want to share with you three things I've learned along this journey that can change and shape our world. So, the journey. You see, I was born in a different time period than some of you here today. I was born in the information age, surrounded by technology, and I want you to walk in my shoes. I want you to imagine being born in the information age here. And so I want to go through my, my personal journey, but before I begin that, I want to show just some of the technology that already existed before I was even born. The Nintendo Game Boy in 1989, the first cell phone in 1984 priced at $4,000. Anybody here own the first cell phone? Well, I was born in 1991 in Salt Lake City, Utah, and this is where my journey began. And as I moved along the first decade of my life, these companies started coming into existence. Companies like eBay, Amazon, Google, and these companies shaped my life, who I am, and where I am today. But moving on with the second decade of my life, when I was 12, I received my first computer. Now, this was such a critical time for me because I was exploring. The internet was in front of me and I could go anywhere I wanted and this was an amazing time in my life. A year later I received my first cell phone and this is where my journey began as a mobile learner. When I was 14 I played a lot of video games, a lot of online video games specifically. Anyone here like to play online video games? Anyone who have kids here who like to play video games? All right, well, for me, it was a big part of growing up, and I wanted to share a personal story briefly. I played a game called Star Wars Galaxies Online when I was 14, and uh, in this game, I started a fake virtual business and was one of the first millionaires in this game, and I had 30 and 40-year-olds working for me in this virtual world. And this was when I was 14, but everything I learned in this online game, I apply to my real business today, and so it was a big part of my journey. A year later, I dove into the world of social media. Now, not only was I exploring the world around me, I was sharing, collaborating, I had a say, and I could put my opinion out there. But then in 2009, my world began to change. I received my first smartphone, and with this smartphone, I started using it in high school to take notes, read books, graphing calculators, etc. But I quickly became frustrated with my education because my teachers took this device up. They said I was not allowed to use it. And I saw a huge divide between what my education was and my real world. My education in 2009 as a high school student looked something like this. We started to see the use of word processing, computer labs, not really a whole lot of the internet and almost no use of these mobile devices and cell phones. And my team and I have come up with a list of grievances growing up in the education system. And I'd like to share just some of those points with you. Students and learners cram and memorize for a test and then forget it all the next day. Buy outdated textbooks and never open them. Are expected to learn to survive in the real world without even experiencing the real world. Schools are bound to four walls and desk, are killing creativity from Sir Ken Robinson. Our current education system is built on an outdated and antiquated model, fails to account for the different learning styles of today's digital natives, and fails to embrace technology, mobile communications, and new innovative teaching methods. And I want to show a video from the documentary Waiting for Superman that shows where we rank 
compared to the rest of the world in 2009. Let me paint it for you this way. America's education system is the Titanic. It is this huge industrial age model and there is so much infrastructure in place that it's hard to change directions. But the problem is we're headed straight for that information age and there's an iceberg in our way. This iceberg represents the challenges each and every one of us face to get to the information age. The problem are not the students, are not the teachers, the problem lies within ignorance. People not aware of the need for change. Fear of that change. And government bureaucracy and red tape that slows progression down. iSchool Initiative is here today to address this iceberg. And while this is where my education was, this is where I felt it was, it might be a bleak picture, but we've already come a long way. This was in 2009. But my real world looks something like this. We started to see the use of internet, computers, cell phones merging into one, and to me this is what I call mobile learning. Now like I said, in 2009, I started using that smartphone to do various different things, but as my teachers began to take it up, I became frustrated, and so I decided to do something about it. As a high school senior, I created a YouTube video showing how a one-to-one -one mobile learning initiative could transform and revolutionize our education system. And I put it on YouTube. And I want to go ahead and play the first minute of that video I put on YouTube. Now this video was uploaded onto YouTube now over three years ago, and it's already outdated, but this was the catalyst. This is what started the iSchool Initiative as I created this YouTube video. But like I said, it's outdated. Uh, in 2010, Apple did release the first tablet. This was a big game changer in education. I now bring my tablet and only my tablet to all of my college courses. I do not own books, paper, pens, printers, anything. I'm completely digital, and that's what our presentations focus on, how that's possible. Now, this YouTube video and th these concepts I've been talking about are what created the birth of iSchool Initiative. 
iSchool Initiative is a completely student-led nonprofit dedicated to revolutionizing our education system through innovative technology. Our mission is to motivate and inspire students to become lifelong learners in the information age. But most importantly, we are students attempting to change education as we know it. We must rethink, retool, and rebuild our current education model if we are to better prepare our students for the challenges they will face as they go into the workforce. Now since then, this idea of mobile learning, this simple concept, has led us to many different places. And our organization primarily does seminars and presentations that focus on inspiring change, inspiring schools to reimagine that learning and what it could be. And with our organization, we also offer a lot of professional development. That's what we do as an organization to help teachers from a student perspective. We offer sessions on digital storytelling with the iPad, social media, fitness and health, art, music, many, many other subjects, um, even things like building a Prezi, which is the software I use to build this presentation. But all of our presentations focus on this three-step concept of find, filter, and apply. No longer is it as valuable in the workplace to cram and memorize everything up here. It is more valuable if you can quickly and effectively find the right information and then apply it. Critical thinking and problem solving are now more important than ever. And I mentioned the idea of, of cramming for a test and, and um, my personal experience with this as a college student is, um, you know, I stayed up till 4 a.m memorizing um, and, and trying to get ready for a history test, I believe it was. I was walking to, in the morning to class and um, someone tried stopping to talk to me and I said, no, 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 I can't talk right now. I'm about to go take this test, just explode all my knowledge on the paper and then forget it right afterwards. And that's kind of what I've done a lot when I've taken these tests. So again, find, filter, and apply. And I want to play a clip from one of my favorite movies that embodies this concept. It's from the movie The Matrix. I don't know about you, but that looks like mobile learning to me. Maybe we're not quite there yet. But again, these are the presentations and seminars that my team and I do that focus on this power of an idea and how a simple idea that a 17-year-old has in high school can change and transform the world we live in. Now, since inception with this idea, it has become a reality in schools all over the world. In the last year, my journey has taken me over 22 states, presenting to over 40,000 people, spreading our message for change in the classroom. One school in particular that we've worked with was Kearns High. They uh, adopted our vision after watching our videos, received a million dollar grant, and implemented 2,000 mobile devices with all of their high school students. We opened it up with a live concert to, in front of the whole student body to get them excited about their new learning initiative. I want to go ahead and play the first minute of our experience with Kearns High. And again, we opened it up all on mobile devices with a live concert with my team.
I'll go ahead and stop it there, but those, those kids, I kid you not, were just screaming the whole time. They were so excited to learn above all else. And before our presentation, they thought, I can't believe the school's giving me an MP3 slash Facebook slash Angry Birds device. <laughs> and it wasn't until after our presentation that they got it. They understood why mobile learning and how it would transform their lives forever. Now, I want to go through just a couple points here. Um, since we've implemented the devices with the school, we've had some different results with the students. I just want to share a few of them with you. Um, before the program, we had them fill out a survey, and four months later, we had them fill the same survey out again. And so, before the program, 78% of the students said, I get bored in class several times a week or more. Only four months later, that went down to 42%. More importantly, 5.7% of the students said they spend five to 10 hours reading and studying for class outside of class. That went up to almost 25% in the span of four months. It's about creating lifelong learning, taking learning beyond the four walls of those classrooms, and that's what these students had the ability to do. When we asked which of the following almost always excites you, teacher lectures 9%, presentations 20 and using the mobile devices and technology over 50%. It's about engaging our students and speaking their language. One last thing I'll share with you um, with them is that they, their graduation rate went from 80% to 90% in seven months um, after the year with this iPod Touch program. Moving on with my journey though, that's led me where I am today. In 2011, I entered into a Google Young Minds competition. You submit a one minute YouTube video if you're between the ages of 18 and 24, showing how you're changing the world. I had the privilege of being selected as one of the winners and attended Google's Zeitgeist Conference. This was an exclusive conference for some of today's current world leaders. And at this conference, I had the opportunity to meet people like Larry Page, the CEO of Google, Sir Richard Branson from Virgin Mobile, Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post, Chelsea Clinton, Deepak Chopra, Mark Cuban, and many, many other individuals. But one of the most interesting people I met and talked with was actually in the top left here. His name is Peter. He is the creator of Angry Birds. And I enjoyed talking to him and his message because he told us that most people think Angry Birds was this overnight success, that he became a millionaire like that. But he paints a completely different picture. He told us that Angry Birds was the 58th game they ever developed. They failed 57 times before they finally found something that made them successful. And I think it's an all too important message of the importance of failure to succeed and how he tried, he was determined, and he tried again and again until he finally found something that worked. And then in the last six months or so, we've had the opportunity of reaching a global audience. We traveled to Tanzania and Africa where we presented to thousands of college students who were training to become teachers. And my experience there was so amazing because here we are where they don't have running water, they didn't have electricity, but they all had cell phones. Not only did they all have cell phones, but I was on a safari 10 feet away from a giraffe, and I pull out my phone, and I have full 3G service on my phone. They are so well connected out there. They're skipping landlines, they're skipping laptops, they're going straight to mobile learning, and while we're the Titanic, they're a sailboat, and they're going right to the information age. And then last, I'll mention my trip to Barcelona, Spain, where we were asked to speak at the uh, largest mobile conference in the world, about 70,000 people and companies coming together to discuss the mobile industry. And we spoke on behalf of M Education and M Youth, and it was, so, it was um, really neat going there because we got to see what's to come with mobile devices in the next year to two years. And if you think mobile learning and mobile devices are big in your industry or in education right now, just wait until you see what some of these companies are coming out with in the next year or so. Jumping right into 2012, um, and the last few points I want to make about my personal journey. Um, about three days ago, we submitted our own 
um, iTunes application. It's a totally free app. It's called Apps for iSchool, and it's not been approved yet. But what this app does is a filter system. We found that most educators, their biggest struggle is finding the best educational applications. And so we've been working a year to build a database and develop an app that all it is is a filter system. Basically, you can search for science, 12th grade, um, paid iPad apps, or college level math apps, and so on. And I'll show this app a little bit later, but this is currently being approved by Apple, and it will be out in the next few days. And then the last thing I want to mention is um, something that really has been amazing for my team and I in the last couple uh, weeks here. This summer, my team and I wanted to reach as many people as possible. And so we thought about holding our own conference, but it was expensive and it was hard to bring people to us. So we thought, why not be a mobile conference on wheels? And about five months ago, we needed to raise $150,000 and book 21 cities of presentations for this summer. We were able to pull it off last minute. We traveled in this huge tour bus. You can see a picture of it over here. And we went to 21 different cities talking about our message and what we're currently doing. And I just got back about a week and a half ago. We finished this tour up in, uh, in Georgia, where I'm from. And it was just amazing to travel all over the country, see all these beautiful cities, and meet wonderful people, all with a common goal to get our students where they need to be so they can be prepared for the future. And so this has been my journey that has led to the creation and the birth of iSchool Initiative. Now, I want to switch gears here, though, and, and ask a very important question, and that is why. Why mobile and why now? And I want to focus on just four points for me personally. Organization is something I think we overlook often. Before I was a digital student, I was the student with a big wad of paper crammed into my backpack, and that's what I called my folder. And it wasn't until I became digital that I was able to organize my life. And I want to just share a couple pictures of random students at Kennesaw State University and what they carried to class every day. This is what I saw. And again, let me just reiterate, I only take my iPad, 1.3 pounds, to all of my classes, and it's amazing what this can do. About a year ago, I received an email from a 12-year-old boy from the Caribbean. This is him on the left here, and um, I'll go ahead and read it to you. I apologize about the grammar, but he is 12. I have saw your video both on CNN and YouTube, and for a 12-year-old boy, I got a great idea. See, I live in an island in the Caribbean, and I go to school every day with heavy books. What is the result? Exhaustion, tiredness, humpbacks. School is already a place with ch challenges for the academically privileged, but to have to carry heavy bags to school, that is torture. That is torture. And I'm just imagining this poor 12-year-old boy here, carrying a backpack that's heavier than him, walking to school uphill both ways. And it just blows my mind that there are more effective ways of doing this, and we're currently not seeking them out. So being organized was a big part of my life. Also, this idea of internet access 24-7. Now, this is an amazing concept that is changing everything with every industry. How many of you here have a smartphone? Well, I'm sure you've experienced this. You're on the go. You don't know what something is. What do you do? You Google it. You go and find it. You get the information you need. We are now plugged into a vast amount of information anywhere at any time. And this is a big changer for us. For me, the internet and connectivity allows us to spend less time doing the mundane tasks in our lives and more time on that critical thinking and that problem solving. These mobile devices are so quick at getting the information we need. I can focus on the conversation. I can focus on the face-to-face. -face. I can focus on what really matters in my life. And third, the savings. And uh, my team and I have been working on a case study that shows if you buy a tablet as a freshman in college, you'll save around $3,100 over your four years of college. This is by going to digital textbooks. 
by using the $1 graphing app as opposed to a $120 graphing calculator, by not buying pens, paper, printers, backpacks, all those different things that add up. I know that for me as a college student, I've saved thousands of dollars by being a digital student. And so the savings are a big reason for it. And our university of 25,000 students, if we were to go completely digital, the student body would collectively save $34.4 million our first year if we implemented digital learning. And the last thing I want to mention are the applications. And I want to switch gears here and not just talk about why mobile learning, but I want to show you how, how I use this device every day to transform my personal education. And there's many ways I do this. I mentioned being organized, so I just want to jump right into kind of how I stay on top of my assignments as a college student. This is called iStudies Pro, and it's an agenda app. But what I like about this is I have my classes and assignments for today on the front page. I can go here and see all of my different assignments color coordinated by my classes. And you'll notice that it says all of these are overdue. It's not because I'm a bad student. This is from last semester. I'm just, I left it up there as an example. But I have all my different classes and I can um, see when things are due. I just plug all this in at the beginning of semester. But when looking at technology, we need to ask ourselves, how is this not just replacing currently what we're doing? Because replacing is just a step. How is it enhancing the experience, enhancing that learning experience? And so for me, while this replaces a paper back, back agenda, it also solves another problem. I would often write things in my agendas and then forget to go check it and still miss my assignments. But with this app, it sends me a text message the day before saying, you have homework due tomorrow. And so this app has saved me countless times. It's an agenda that keeps me in check. And it has saved me countless times as a learner to keep on track of all my assignments. So I just wanted to mention that as how I stay organized. But the number one question I get is, how do you take notes as a college student on this device? And so I'm going to share a couple ways I do this personally. Most college students use pen and paper, and they write bullet points. But to me, bullet points are not very effective. How do you take those bullet points and then study them? And so I skip the process altogether. I build flashcards as the lecture is going. Let me show you what, what I mean. We can go to business law. Here are all my business law classes I took a couple semesters ago. You can see I can flip to the back. And this is called Cramberry, and it's just an app I use to take all my notes on. I put everything in question format. It's very easy to add a card. I just click the plus button, and then it will give me a front and a back. So I'm in class. This is business law. Let's say we're talking about larceny. I would type in what is larceny. And then I would put the definition on the back. But what's really cool is if you have the iPad 3, you can just do this. The definition of larceny is, and I could literally type all my notes like this if I wanted. So this is how I'm building my notes in my class. And so after I build them all, I click the play button, and I can start studying my flashcards. So it gives me the front of the card. I see if I know it, show answer. If I got it wrong, I'll put incorrect and it will repeat those cards that I get wrong. So all too often, when I go to study groups and study sessions, we're always using my notes because I have them in an awesome question format that is great for studying. Now, I want to go back to this idea of internet access 24-7, though, because here's the game changer with these flashcards. Here's how it's also enhancing. No matter where you are, if you have 15 minutes at the bank, 30 minutes on the bus ride home. Wherever you are, you can pull this out and start studying your flashcards, even if it's for five minutes. How many of you, when you were students, did you carry 300 flashcards with you everywhere you went? Anybody? Couple of us in the back. There's always a couple of you guys. For me, I could not do this. But now I have them with me everywhere I go. My laptop, my computer, my iPad, wherever I am, I can pull these flashcards out and start studying them. So this is how I take notes in a lot of my classes. However, flashcards are not always the most effective way. Sometimes you do want some bullet points or word processing. 
So I use an app called Pages. That is Apple's version of Microsoft Word. And um, here's my notes for Econ 3300. I think this is business, statistic, economic, something, something, something. And you can see all my notes here I took in class. I've got color-coordinated tables and charts that all match with a graph I made in here and imported it right into the document. It took me half the time to make that um, graph than it did the other students. As I scroll down, you can see I have um, pictures that I inserted here. Now, this is a picture of a question out of a textbook. And I'm going to talk about this a little, little bit later, but I don't buy any of my textbooks. And one day, I was sitting in this class, and we had to do one problem out of the book. So rather than pay $150 to do that one problem, I grabbed my neighbor's book and said, hey, can I take a picture of it real quick and put it in my notes? And so this is what I did. But I want to show you something I created in Pages for my fitness class. And I, it's a, in PDF format now, so I'm just going to pull it up in my iBooks. Here we are. So in my fitness class, we had to build a huge log over the whole semester. And most students were turning in you know, a bunch of cereal boxes and a binder full of paper that big to their teachers. And I asked my professor if I could turn in a completely digital copy. He said, absolutely, that sounds fantastic. So I'm going to show you what I made. I'm going to go really quickly through it, just so you get some of the highlights. But what I want you to do is imagine the possibility that your students could have with something like this. So we have a cover page, table of contents, chapter one summary with image and text built in, different graphs and charts I took for the class, more labs, chapter summaries. I'm going to skip some of this. Hopefully I don't make you too sick. We had to measure our BMI. I used an app to calculate this and put it right in the uh, document. We had to measure how many steps we were taking for the whole semester. And uh, so I used an app to replace the pedometer log. But again, it's not just about replacing that pedometer. How is it changing and altering the experience? So the blue bar represents my phone. And what it told me was my steps per day. And the green bar represents my goal for every week. But what this did is it didn't tell me just what steps I did. It also, I could pull up a Google map and show everywhere I've been that day. So I could also turn that into my professor and say, not only did I walk 7,000 steps, but you can see I ran around campus four times. I walked over here, walked here, and show them the big picture. We had to build a workout routine. I used an app called iFitness. This app allowed me to build an effective workout routine and then gave me text instruction, image instruction, and video instruction on how to effectively do every type of workout. Now, this was really important because we can't always have a personal trainer with us, but it's important that we're not hurting ourselves as we're building this, this workout routine. And last, we had to measure how many calories we were intaking every day in the classroom. And I used an app called MealSnap. Rather than look at the back of cereal boxes, I simply pulled out my phone, took a picture of the item, and just off of that picture, it tells you how many calories it is and what the food item is. So on the left here, we have this is an apple pastry at 304 calories. In the middle, it says this is a strawberry milkshake with whipped cream, and it is 264 calories. Now, you're probably wondering what I was thinking when I first found this app, and that is, how does it work? And I think I figured it out. They must have a tiny room with 100 computers and 100 people just sitting there waiting for these pictures to come in. <laughs> and as they come in, they just send out the answer. It's got to be the only way. But this is what I turned in to my HPS class. And my professor enjoyed it so much that he had me present it in front of the rest of the classroom. Now, while I have iBooks up, I want to talk about textbooks. I mentioned that I don't buy any of my textbooks, and there's a couple different reasons for this. Uh, the main one being, why would I spend $150 for information that is already free on the internet? And so the idea is that while many books are going digital, they're just simple PDF copies of textbooks. That's still not better. That's only replacing the paper. That's not enhancing the experience. 
So I often don't buy my textbooks for most of my college classes. However, I will put my money towards a completely digital and interactive textbook. And I want to show you what that might look like. There's a couple examples I have here. Um, this is a physics textbook that I'm going to pull up. This book has hours of video, interactive content, and engaging material for students. I'm going to go ahead and open up the cover page first. Already a little bit more engaging. We can jump to different chapters in here. You can see I have highlighted notes and text in here. If I'm reading a book and let's say there's a word I don't know, I just click on that word and click define. Right there in the middle of a book, it defines the word for me. It's about doing things quickly and effectively so I can spend more time on applying that to whatever I'm doing. Videos, built-in quizzes, graphs. I can manipulate objects on here to learn about them. And again, it's not your normal standard st static PDF document for a textbook. There's video on here I can play. The bridge does eventually break. I'll just fast forward because I know you all want to see it now. But just hours of content and really comes to life. But what's so great about these textbooks is that anybody can come become content creators now. So you as a professor can create your own interactive iBook. And I just want to show you what, what I mean by that and how easy it is. This is one we're building called iPad Bootcamp. It's all the basics you need to know as a teacher on how to use the iPad effectively in the classroom. And we plan on publishing this fairly soon as an organization. But you can see I've got tons of pictures in here, videos, different texts. We can still highlight. And this is a textbook that we built, very easy to build. We've got tutorial pictures in here. We've got video. So we're going to set it up there. This is a video you guys are supposed to see. <laughs> Jack, what about you? In my defense, this was, I was in Spain at this time. I was very, very tired. But again, you can see how easy it is. Um, you can create your content. Imagine, as a professor, creating a syllabus that was completely interactive. So again, let's say I want to build a magazine based off of our Twitter account. Compiles our Twitter, and right there, it's building a magazine for you, for you. So you can literally read everything we're tweeting about. Here is. Um, we were at Otterbox headquarters. They have a slide in their office. We took a picture of it and tweeted it out. Um, we've got different video we've been tweeting out here. We've got all the tweets and information um, that you can read about. Here's pictures of our tour we were on. <laughs> Funny that that came up. I was at, has anyone heard of ISTE, the conference? A couple of us. This was in San Diego uh, this year, and our tour stopped in San Diego. Um, about 20,000 educators coming together. It's K through 12 mostly. But um, I was so over exhausted by this point of the tour that they hadn't sent me to EMT for a while. But again, you can see other pictures, pictures of our bus. And you can follow our journey right here in a magazine format. So again, you can search for any topic you're interested in, and it will put this in this magazine format, where you can also click on the picture, comment on it, and read more about it. I'm going to go ahead and jump back into my presentation here. And like I, uh, I said, I wanted to... I wanted to end with three things that I've learned along this journey that can change and shape. First, work hard, fail a lot, but learn more. High School Initiative has failed countless times, but it's because of those failures 
that we are where we are today. I feel that all too often in education, students are pressured to not fail. They're pressured to get the A. Students want to know what they need to do not to learn, but how to get the A at the end of the day. And so many of my peers are afraid of doing anything worthwhile because they're afraid of failure. So work hard, fail a lot, but learn more. Second, have a love of learning, an absolute desire and love of learning. Because I truly believe that in the information age, the individuals who have a passion to learn, lifelong learning, are going to be the ones who lead a life of significance. Will be the game changers in this world. Will be the top 5% that change and shape our world and where it is today. And last, lead the way. You can't change others, you can only change your stuff. So rather than say, my school won't think this way, my school will never adopt any digital concepts, online learning, anything like that. Challenge yourself to prove them wrong. Often teachers come to me and say, I can't do this, my school won't let me, or my school's not supportive. <clears throat> well, do it anyway, be the innovative teacher, and lead the way. Show them by example how you can accomplish and change and do amazing things. Now I want to end on a simple quote, and then we can open it up to questions. And that is, when your passion and your purpose are greater than your fear and excuses, you will find a way. Thank you so much for your time. I believe we have five minutes or so for questions. Uh, would anyone like to ask? Any questions at all about high school initiative, mobile learning, or anything we've talked about today? Yes. Great question. Are you, uh, the question was, are we going to open it up to other platforms? I would like to say that we are not Apple focused as much as it seems we are sometimes. The idea is we focus on whatever type of technology is best and ready for the market. And we believe that the iPad compared to other tablets is far ahead in many different ways. However, we also promote the use of Amazon Fire, we promote the use of Android, we've done a lot of Android training. So it's not specific to a device necessarily, but the concept is that we need to have a paradigm shift. We need to change the way we think. And so yes, we're opening it to other technology, especially as more technology is coming into existence, but we do do a lot of iPad focus right now, simply because the demand is there. There's more people deploying iPads in education than any other device right now, so that's been a big problem. However, we're seeing a major shift with Android devices to really push this more heavily into the classroom, and they can be more affordable. Other questions? Yes. That's actually, the day that happens will be great for education, and here's why. So the question was, what happens when the novelty wears off of these mobile devices and tablets when it's just a commonplace with students? The problem I've experienced with schools and education is that we focus too much on the technology. You know, we go to computer labs and say, okay kids, today we're going to learn the technology. Then we go to the class and we're like, okay kids, uh, today we're going to learn the technology. And there's such a separation and a gap. And the novelty of these devices can be a good and a bad thing. It's, it's kind of like students are so excited to even have it in front of them, they want to do so much on it. But when it finally becomes a tool in the background, the novelty wears off and it's understood from the students and from the teachers that this is a great tool to be used on the side and not something we have to focus on. And that's, that's the problem I've seen all too often in education. We put the technology and we kind of force them to use it. That's not the purpose. We just want to have options. And we want to have them the ability to look up information and use it. So, so to answer your question, I believe that when the novelty lives on, we will see true learning take place. We will see dynamic change in the classroom. And we will see student engagement already exist 
because we're speaking their language and they're able to learn the best way they want to learn. Some students may want to learn pen and paper. That's the other thing I would tell people, is just like I was frustrated learning with pen and paper and I wanted to use technology, you can't go extreme the other way. You can't force and say, now everybody has to learn this way and we can't learn this way. The idea is to have options out there on the table. So again, I'm, I'm excited for that day when we're not going to keep off. I don't think we'll have to keep updating and trying to have the newest novelty to keep our students in here. Yes? Um, so are there any particular disciplines or subjects that are not as effective to use with technology? So like maybe like math, for example, as a discipline. We've definitely seen certain industries take off with this and certain industries kind of not as much. Um, the, the number one that's taking off probably special education. Um, that has completely taken off and, and done amazing and wonderful things. Um, some subjects that we originally had a hard time with, math was a very hard one to use on the tablet. Why? Because you want to write out problems. However, in the last couple months, there's been a new stylus that came out that's like a ballpoint pen. It is literally just like writing on the ballpoint pen. And as this technology progresses, things like math um, is becoming a lot easier to use. Fitness uh, has been a great industry that's been affected by this and, and very positive. You saw the way I don't mind fitness law. Um, science is definitely a big one. And a lot of the core subjects, but even a lot of the electives. So let's take art, for example. There are amazing ways you can use this as a tool in art. Even if you're just Googling images to start drawing it or sculpting, there's so many innovative ways people are using it. So there's really not a discipline or a subject this device cannot or has not reached, but there are definitely ones that it has been a little bit more effective in adopting the classroom. Yes? <laughs> Um, I, you know, I have a hard time trying to think of where I'm going to be tomorrow at this point. So trying to think five years can be very difficult. Um, you know, for me personally, I love being an entrepreneur and I love education. And I think that my passion is always going to be with those two combined. Um, I'm going to continue with high school just to continue reforming education and pushing this. Um, but who knows where it's going to take me. You know, if you asked me two years ago, I would not have told you I'd be here on stage in front of you all today. And so it's, it's kind of hard to answer that question, but I know that it's going to be business and education uh, for many, many years to come. Yes? Um, so Okay, so the question was, um, how do you build an app? How do you get who approves it? How do you determine if it's free or not? And a little bit more about the stuff we're developing. And so for, for us, um, it really depends. There's a lot of questions here and a lot of explaining I could do, but I'll try and uh, simplify it. We're developing an iPad bootcamp hybrid that is not an application, it's like a textbook. But we are developing our own app, which looks something like this. I've got the data on here, apps for iSchool. And again, we've been developing this for like a year. And you can search for, let's say you want iPad, pay, college only, you want science apps. Done. It filters all the apps suggested by our team. You can click on the app, it gives you descriptions, and it links you right to iTunes, and it tells you more about that application. So this is the app we developed that you, you were mentioning earlier. Now, developing it can be tricky. Um, you could develop one for relatively free. It's not going to be very dynamic. Um, you can also develop web-based apps, meaning it's not on the iTunes market. You just go to a URL, and it's a very mobile-friendly website, basically. That's relatively cheap and free, and most schools do that. If you want to build a native app, which is an app that's submitted into the iTunes or Android market, you have to have, uh, for iTunes, you have to have Apple approved it. So we just submitted this app to um, Apple, and then they approve it, and then it's publicly on the iTunes market. So whether it's free or not, it's totally up to you, but if you do anything paid on the iTunes market, Apple does take a 30% cut of it. So these are all the details. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but that, those are the details, and please feel free to come up to me afterwards and, and ask as well. I think we have time for one more quick question. Yes.
Uh, the question was, what are some resources we can use to keep our students engaged so they're not on Facebook, email, and, and texting and things like that, is that correct? Okay, great question. Um, if you, this, you may experience this um, if you do any face-to-face -face classroom teaching as a professor. I walk into one of my classes and I see 50 computer screens up and I see Facebook on every single one of them. And we automatically say, oh no, technology is bad. Oh no, you know, look at what we're doing here. But then you take a look at the center of the stage and you see that the professor is doing a PowerPoint hour and a half lecture on the subject. And we wonder why our students are on Facebook. We wonder why they're using this. And so we've got to ask ourselves, what do we need to change to make them engaged, to make them excited? And something I was told that I really enjoyed was uh, the role of the teacher is changing. No longer is a professor a sage on the stage, but a guy on the side. The idea is how can we collaborate, do things better with each other, as opposed to a lecture style. And it's a struggle in college, because I'm in classes with 250 students. I mean, how do you do collaboration and peer-to-peer -peer work in that situation? So it's a difficult task. But when it comes to resources and engaging our students um, with this technology, there's many, many out there. I mean, obviously, I do talk a lot about apps, um, but apps are only if they all have these mobile devices often. Um, often teachers use their mobile device and plug it into the screen, though, and that's great. One way I would say that really keeps an audience engaged is Prezi. How many of you here have heard of Prezi? Oh wow, a lot of us. Okay, awesome. Well, my whole presentation that you saw was built with Prezi, E-R-E-Z-I.com. It's a free software for educators in schools, and um, it's a new way to do PowerPoint, basically. I do another workshop called Death to PowerPoint on with Prezi, but the idea is I never want to see a PowerPoint again. That's my personal role of mine. So um, anyway, this is one resource. There's many, many others out there. Please come feel free to talk to me afterwards. I know we're out of time. I want to pull up one thing as I end here. This is, uh, I would really appreciate your feedback. This is a QR code you can scan or go to bit.ly slash iSchoolFeedback. If you fill this survey out, just saying what you thought and give feedback, it will also, also send you a link of where you can find the Prezi. It will send you a link to more information about our app and things like that. So I'm going to leave this up here. You guys can fill it out. Um, at the end of the day, it's going to be there. But again, thank you so much for your time, and thank you for allowing me to come here.